Hey everyone, welcome. We're gonna get started at about two minutes after. We're just getting people time to get logged in here. Welcome everybody. Again, we're going to start at 11.02. Um, we're going to give people time to get signed in and ready. Hopefully your Thursday or wherever you're at in the world. Uh, you guys, your guys' week is going well. So as we're getting ready to get started, I'll do some, uh, my name's Justin, I'm not Johnny. Your, your presenter is gonna <laughs> pop on here shortly, but I wanna do some housekeeping real quick. So if you have questions, uh, make sure to ask those in q and it, It's easier for us to keep those, uh, keep track of those in Q&A versus chat. Um, this is a week of webinar that Specter Ops has been given um, this week, starting Monday. It's done by the three different teams here at Specter Ops adversary detection, adversary resilience, and adversary simulation. I will drop links to the previous talks and you can always still um, sign up for tomorrow's talk. Uh, we'll drop all the links here shortly. Uh, the slides and the video from today will be shared about a couple or uh, about two or three hours after we close out today. Um, Got to have the video process and then we'll share it out. Uh, with that being said, <clears throat> Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Johnny Johnson. He's from our adversary detection team. Go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. Today, we're going to be going over capability abstraction, specifically um, with dumping LSAS. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am an associate here on the adversary detection team. I have contributed to a couple of open source projects, OSUM and Mordor being one of them, or two of them. I do hold some projects myself on my GitHub, um, as well as some of my current research interests have been data recently, code abstraction and reverse engineering. I do hold a blog on the link below there on Medium. So today we're gonna to be talking about capability abstraction. However, before we can talk about capability abstraction, we have to talk about another um, process that abstraction fits into, and that is known as the funnel fidelity. This um, was introduced by the technical director on the detection team, Jared Atkinson. Um, and he, at the bottom here is a link to his blog. The funnel has five stages and the funnel is a process of smartly filtering out noise, which hopefully results in spending more time on the activity that is most likely to be malicious. This means each stage within the funnel takes an input that was generated in the previous stage, performs some sort of filtering or noise reduction, and produces an output for the following stage. And ideally each stage allows for deeper and more manual analysis to be applied to the event in question because non-relevant events have been filtered out. Capability abstraction is gonna be a sub-process within this funnel. And it's going to fit um, inside of the detection phase of the um, funnel. So what is capability abstraction? It is a process to help us peel back layers by which an attack can be performed. It is um, a process that finds root commonalities between open source code and closed source. When I say closed source, I mean things like task manager, we'll look into that today, or other um, native processes on um, a machine. One thing to note um, is while going through this, um, we are gonna be doing some code abstraction today and I'll be going as slow as possible. However, if you have any questions, please post that in the Q&A. Um, the reason why we're talking about this process is we hold much value in it within our detection team because this is something that we have tried many times within our 
um, clients' environments and it has been something that has been successful um, each time we've tried it. It is something that um, we not only teach this concept within our detection course, but we actively practice this concept within the client engagements when building out detections. Within abstraction, the first thing that we have to do is we have to pick a technique to abstract. Um, we're going to utilize dumping LSAS. Um, keep in mind, this is a sub technique of the overarching technique credential access. If you look on the left at T1003, that is going to be the technique ID that um, correlates with MITRE itself. Um, so the first thing whenever we pick a technique, obviously, is we want to define and understand what the technique is doing. And the first thing we're going to do is define LSAS. So LSAS is a subsystem service process for the local security authority. Um, it is a Windows process and it is responsible for enforcing the security policies on the system. Um, credentials can be stored in memory on behalf of the user with remote interactive or interactive logon sessions. And LSAS stores credentials in memory so that the user doesn't have to authenticate for every computer server service that it wants access to. So how can adversaries take advantage of this native process or subsystem process that is on the Windows machine? Well, one way and the one that we are going to be focusing on today is adversaries can actually dump the memory information of the LSAS process to acquire plain text credentials of users. Another way, and we're not going to be focusing on this method today, but um, this they can also modify, modify the security support provider configurations within the registry. So that when the system reboots or a specific API is called, in this instance, it's going to be a add security package, they can start to collect the user's plain text credentials. So the first thing whenever we're creating the abstraction is we want to list out all the different tools or implementations that we know of and we have access to um, so that we can see this activity and how it is performed and then start to abstract each layer. So the one that we're going to be focusing specifically on today is out mini dump out mini dump is going to be part of power split, which was um, created by Matt Graber and um, Rolf Schroeder. And the code here, we're going to be looking at this code. And if you would like to look at it and follow along the code um, link is right there. So out mini dump PowerShell. So um, this is going to be done within PowerShell. And um, we're going to want to just basically walk through the code and see what are some things that we can pick out as defenders that we can find and utilize within this process and abstract to see what we might be able to pivot on and um, use as a choke point within our detections. So if I look through here, I see an example of git process LSAS out mini dump. That is particularly interesting because I see the out mini dump on the right, but on the left, I'm seeing git processes uh, or git process and then the name of the process I want. That's particularly interesting because I don't know how git process is getting the process information of LSAS. So we are going to dig into that. On the right here, we see another picture and this is going to be the process function. And on the right over here, we can see a whole bunch of um, properties being passed through parameters, which um, is going to be of interest because we see here at the bottom that an API is being invoked and that those parameters are being passed through to that API call. Um, so right now I'm going to make note of two things. I'm going to make note of the git process commandlet within PowerShell. And I'm also going to make note of the mini dump write dump API call being used here. Um, some other things to keep in mind, we will go through or these parameters and the properties that are being passed through. We want to keep these um, in kind of back of our head, but we don't want to get overwhelmed right now. So we're just going to write these down and just kind of come back to them later on. So here we've written these down, we've made note of them. Um, but however, I'm curious as to how Git process is actually getting process information. If you are not familiar with um, PowerShell in itself and how it is written and how commandlets are being used, they are written um, within the .NET framework utilizing C sharp classes and C sharp methods. Um, so we're going to go through and actually break down this commandlet to see exactly what API it is invoking on the back end um, to get the process information. So to abstract this, we are going to first get the information that we want from the get process um, commandlet. 
And so here, what I did was I ran git command, git process, and I formatted a couple of things that I would like to see. What is of interest is the assembly library that is being loaded um, whenever this command that is being utilized. So I want to make a note of that because this is something that we are going to actually open to um, see some more information. And then I'm also seeing here that the implementation type is git process command. This is a class that is being a C sharp class that is being utilized. And that is something I want to keep in note as well, because we will break this down. So I'm going to actually open up DNSPY. Um, DNSPY is can be thought of either as a dynamic or static um, analysis tool. It does have dynamic analysis kind of implementations where you can attach it, attach a process to a debugger and step through the code. But here we're going to just do it as a static and just kind of follow the code. So here I've done that. I've opened up that assembly um, library and I found the correct class and I'm going to walk through this. Um, if you look right here, um, you do see that class again, and this is going to be what we're going to be walking through. Um, we're not going to go through each part of the code here and explain what's going on, but just kind of an overarching understanding. Git, git process is going to pass through the parameter LSAS, which is the name. Um, and so we are going to go to this for each process in base dot matching processes, because we're going to be looking for any process that matches that process name. I'm not going to go through each step because this goes, does go through a couple different functions and methods. I'm just going to show the beginning and the end here. Um, but just kind of keep in mind that many times through this abstraction process, we do use DNSPY or other ways to pull apart the code to see how it is um, being functionally used. So again, we're going to be looking at this matching processes method here. And then I'm going to eventually get into this get process infos method and I'm going to look through here and at the bottom you can see native methods .nt query system information some parameters are being passed through this is an interest and I'm going to click on this to see exactly what's going on and I want to correlate this with Microsoft because oftentimes um, this could just be an internal um, function being called and it might not actually be an API function um, but in this terms it is and this is actually a documented API function and I'll kind of under I'll kind of explain documented and undocumented APIs here in a little bit as we move further. But what's good about this is now that I can document inside my abstraction map, how Git process is actually um, getting process information, it is going to be utilizing the Git process by name um, or Git processes method. And it is also going to be utilizing the API NT query system information for modern and for legacy, it's going to be a great tool help 32 snapshot. I know that because um, while going through the code, there was an if statement in there talking about um, NT um, windows and older versions of windows and they pass through two different functions. So if you go to the newer modern versions of windows, it will be NT query sense information information. However, what's curious is and one thing while going through this abstraction that we want to do is we want to see if any um, other tools are utilizing these methods because all these tools are going to be um, kind of created differently and function differently to perform the same activity. And that is what's important about this abstraction map is boiling down to see what are things that are the same across that and what are things that the attacker does and does not have control over. So far we have seen a couple things that attackers have 100% control over, which is whether or not they want to use a git process commandlet. Some things that they might not have um, control over or specific API functions that they have to utilize in order to get process information. So going through that, is this method going to be used by any other tools? Well, we're just going to take a look at Shark Dump. And inside this code, inside their mini dump code for Shark Dump, we are going to see that it is actually utilizing the git processes by name method. However, it is also using a different method, get process by ID. That is particularly interesting because these are actually going to be, are going to be coming from um, two different methods. And that means that it is a possibility that how it is getting the process information could be different. It, they could be invoking a different API. So I'm not going to walk through in the code on the get process by ID because we know get processes by name is going to eventually invoke NT query sensitive information. However, 
Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to show the next slide, which will show the um, API that was invoked for Git process by ID, and it is different. So um, for Git processes by ID, the API that is invoked is Git processes. This is particularly interesting because now we know of two different um, APIs that um, an attacker could use to get um, process information. And that is something that I want to know and note. That way, whenever we are creating our detections, our assumptions and our blind spots are very minimal. And that, that is really the goal or one of the goals of doing this. So I'm going to document this and I'm just going to kind of move forward. There's not much left um, in terms of the Git process commandlet for me to dig into. So, um, or these methods. So I'm going to move forward into the last thing that I documented, which is mini dump, write dump. How is the attacker reading the memory of L LSAT and getting its contents? So the first thing I want to do is, I, this is just a process by which I like to go by, is I want to go to the Microsoft documentation. I want to understand exactly what this function is doing and how it is being utilized and what makes this so important. Um, so I'm going to read the definition. It's going to basically write um, information of the memory of the particular process that you're interested in into a specified file. What's interesting and just one thing to keep in note for our back of the heads right now, um, it does write to a specified file. So one thing we're going to test later is whether or not while using this API is if there's going to be an artifact on disk of this file that the contents were then passed to. However, first, I want to look through the code. The code is going to tell me everything I need to know. So what's interesting to me is while going through these parameters, I see process ID. I know that it's util I know that there's going to be an API pass or invoke to get that um, information. Um, however, I see each process, the handle. This is interesting because I didn't see anything really of particular interest or API that was being invoked inside of the out mini dump code that was giving that handle to um, the process. I didn't see any APIs doing that. So I'm gonna go back through the code. And in this, I actually made a video to kind of do this because it's kind of a longer process, but it's still very important to kind of keep, keep in mind. And so this is kind of the process by which I did this. So walking through this, I'm going to show that this is just the out mini dump um, code. You can find this on GitHub. Scrolling down, I'm going to look for anything that involves the handle, and I see that that mini dump write dump is um, API is being invoked. That's particularly interesting, and I'm going to look for that process handle parameter that is being passed through. Right here again, I just wanted to show that this is the correct API, and that the parameters do actually match up um, while doing this. And here I see that handle, it's gonna be the first parameter passed through. So let's go back to the code and find that. Okay, so it's gonna be passed through the process handle um, parameter. And when going through that, I see that process.handle, which is gonna be a property, C sharp property that is going to be passed through. And there's actually Microsoft documentation on this. So I'd want to like read through this, understand exactly how this is doing this. But I can go through PowerShell and I can do git member pipe git process or get process pipe get member. And I see that the type name is gonna be the class that was utilized to pass this through. So I'm gonna go back into DNSpy. I'm gonna to go to that process class and then I'm going to look for anything that is passing handles through. Sure enough, there is. There's get process handle. Interesting. So I'm gonna look through this code. And right here I have that function. I go to this get process handle, I follow this. I'm gonna look through this, kind of read it, try to understand it, see what's going on. I'm gonna scroll down, past the things that we don't need to look at, and then right here, I see process manager .open process. Interesting, I see parameters being passed through as well. I'm gonna look through this code and see what exactly is being done here. And then I see that within this, that native methods .open process is called. So I'm just gonna look through that as well. Interesting, so I see parameters being passed through. I see that there is a function here, and I'm curious now if there's an API that is actually being used here. So let's just go ahead and look at open process, and sure enough, there is an API, and I see these parameters being passed through. Um, this is interesting, and I see that the parameters do match. And then I'm gonna go into the open process 
um, code within IDA, and I'm going to step through its code to understand exactly what it is doing. Maybe are there any undocumented APIs being invoked? I'm going to walk through this. And this process is important, and sure enough, it does call the NT open process um, function. That is particularly interesting, simply because open process is actually a documented API, meaning that this documented API is something that Microsoft supports. It is something that they're going to support. It is something that they're going to keep up with while future version of Windows um, come out. NT open process is actually known as, NT stands for native, which means it's an internal Microsoft um, function. It is an undocumented API, meaning that this um, API is not promised to be supported. It's not documented. Microsoft, this is more done by um, their internal methods and internal functions. The only way undocumented APIs have come to surface is through reverse engineering or code abstraction like this. So what is interesting, one thing I want to note is whenever that um, property gets passed through, that C-sharp property process.handle gets passed through, and that handle is passed to open process, that is something that is explicit. That is something that has to be called and um, has to be done. However, an implicit um, behavior of this is that is going to call NT open process. That is something that the attacker doesn't have control over. So if they want to give that handle, to the process, they don't have to call open process because many times documented um, APIs will invoke, like we see here, an undocumented API, which is an internal function. But they do have to um, call NT open process, which is an undocumented API. This is something that we can maybe utilize and use as a choke point moving forward. So um, next I'm going to um, kind of just show this again in open process and utilize WinDebug to kind of show that, um, do some dynamic analysis and see how this is being done. And just kind of, this is something I do for verification to make sure I am stepping through this code correctly and I'm understanding each um, step in this process. So here I'm going to set a pro I'm going to set a breakpoint for NT open process. I'm press G for go. I'm going to run the command get process LSS pipe out mini dump, which is what we saw in that example earlier within the code. And then I saw the break happen. And whenever I call the stack, sure enough, I do see the NT open process um, code being called. So this is good for me to know. And this is good for me to kind of keep in mind and keep in the back of my head. And this is something we're actually want to document. But now what's interesting to me is what is open process um, doing? Are, are there any parameters being passed through that maybe again, us as defenders can utilize? So walking through this, I see that it basically opens up, um, opens an existing local process object. Um, but one of the parameters that's being passed through is desired access. Interesting, what does this mean? So after some digging and Googling, we come across this other Microsoft documentation, which is about access rights. These access rights, this is gonna be the first page I'm showing. Um, this is basically access rights that um, are granted access that um, if you want access to another process, you have to get a handle of that process. However, whatever you want to perform with that process, you have to give it the rights that you want to. Um, so we're going to walk through and we're going to see that here are the values. And these aren't all the values. Keep in mind, this is just a small snippet. Um, these are the values that can be passed through to the handle for a specific process. However, the question might be, okay, how can we utilize this and how can we then utilize these as the Defenders to maybe look to see what an attacker is doing. Well, the process is actually simpler than I might think. You might think. And we look back at the mini dump write dumps access rights, or their first, we're going to look at like the code and the API function. But with each API, if it has something to do with a process, you will see the parameters H process because that is going to be the handle it has to pass through. And it will tell you actually the process or access rights that the handle must have in order to access the process. This means that as defenders, if an attacker is utilizing mini dump write dump, they have to have a minimum access rights to access that process. There is no maximum. Well, I mean, I guess there is, it's zero times one FFFFF, which is all access. However, we do know that they have to, minim they have, to have the minimum access rights of um, these parameters here. 
And here we see process query information and process VM read. This is interesting. So let's go back to the security rights and see what we can find. Well, sure enough, we see that process query information has a hex value of 400. However, um, there underneath it is process query limited information. And if we look through this definition, a handle that has the process query information access right is automatically granted process query limited information. Again, if they're utilizing mini dump, write dump, then they have to have process query information, but it's also going to give them process query limited information. So that's going to be the hex value 1000. Interesting. Again, we had a process VM read was another access right that they needed. So if we look at that, that's the hex um, 10. So if we add all this together, the minimum access rights that an attacker needs to access a process is going to be hex 1410. This is particularly interesting because there is a logging source or a data sensor that does give us this information. Sysmon gives us this information. So um, one thing to note for the future of our detections and other EDR products as well, give this information um, about access rights, but we can utilize this within our detection because we know that if an attacker is using mini dump, write dump, the minimum access rights, again, there is no maximum, but the minimum that they need is at least 1410. So we want to document that. Awesome. Here I did document that the open handle for open process, that all access rights is going to be hex one f f f f f. That is just the maximum, and I documented it here because when you run out mini dump by itself, just um, just stock, it will come back with those access rights. However, that is not the minimum that an attacker needs again. So, moving forward, I want to know after documenting the read memory, the open handle, the um, API function that needs to get process information different C-sharp methods that utilize, um, that the PowerShell command that utilizes. I want to know, are there any artifacts on the disk that I can see as a defender? Well, if we go back to the mini dump, write dump API function, again, I see that a specified file is written on disk. However, let's test this. Again, I run the command and sure enough, we see that there is a dump file on disk. But the question is, is, is the name of the dump file going to be the same every time? And does the attacker have control of that dump file? Well, they do. They absolutely do. However, when using mini dump write dump, the, the file will be written on disk, but we just don't know what that file name will be. However, with proper data correlation, we can correlate all the data we've then collected thus far and see um, that whenever a file is written on disk with the other um, data relationships that we've made so far. So we want to document what we know and sure enough that we see that an arbitrary dump file is created on disk. We want to go through, I'm not going to go through the whole abstraction map today. This was just to go through one implementation. But after going through the rest of this, we then can see that um, this is kind of the abstraction map for each implementation. However, the question might be, what if we're trying to abstract, again, a closed source process, a native process or a process that is downloaded that we don't necessarily have the capability of um, seeing what its code is. So um, to do this, you have a couple different options. You have um, static analysis, which is Ida Pro and Geirda. Um, and then you also have dynamic, which is WinDebug, um, API Monitor, and DNSpy. DNSpy, again, can both be static and dynamic. Um, typically, but my process typically whenever going through non process or non open source processes, I'll first open that process with an IDA. I'll go through and try to understand exactly, I'll try to find the specific behavior that I'm looking for within that process, and I'll try to find the code that correlates with that, and then I'll go and verify that through dynamic analysis. Again, the code never lies. So if we can follow the code and we can understand what is being done, we can abstract and peel back those layers and then verify and find the behavior that we can pivot on. So as an example of this, let's go through abstracting task manager because task manager does have the ability to create a dump file of a process. So we hear, we see that, we see that, um, that the, there's an option to create a dump file, which is going to dump the contents of LSS's memory. Here I'm going to set a breakpoint for mini dump, write dump, and I'm going to press go. 
and then I'm going to wait. I'm going to then um, press create dump file and wait for the break to happen. And once it does, I'm going to call the stack to see what APIs or what other functions are then invoked. Sure enough, I see that at the bottom here, I see that mini dump write dump is called. And this is then something that we can document and we can see that um, task manager does do. And this is a way to abstract closed source um, processes. Here are um, the resources I did or had. Um, thank you to everybody who came. Um, if you would like to go through these, um, I did have other blog or other blogs, links throughout the um, presentation. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Justin while I go through some of the questions that anybody might have had, and I'll be happy to answer. Hey everyone. <clears throat> So as a reminder, uh, we'll, we'll be doing another session tomorrow where Chris Maddalena from our adversary simulation team will be uh, demonstrating how we do project management and report construction with remote teams. Um, always a challenge. Um, we're gonna give Johnny a few minutes here to, to review some of the questions. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature and we'll get through as many as we can. I in, in the chat window here, you'll see me drop links to all of the pre um, previous webinars and uh, the registration for tomorrow's if you'd like to join that as well. Okay, so first question I have here is this proc dump call the same API calls as that mini dump. Um, kind of go through this. Let's just go back to the abstraction. I don't know off the top of my head here. Um, so proc dump, yeah, it does call, it does invoke NT query system information. Um, it does utilize open process. Um, it does utilize mini dump, write dump, or it does have an option. The dash R inside a product dump does allow you to um, create a clone of a process, which will then invoke PS uh, capture snapshot. Okay. I'm going to go through some more. Slide 20. Um, next question is up to slide 20. What program we're using was it DNSpy? I believe it was DNSpy, but just the Double check for you. Um, oh, so during this, what I was utilizing, yep, so I was utilizing in this demo, I was utilizing DNSPY along with um, IDA. So those were the two I was utilizing. Um, okay, this is a good question. So, um, Basically the question is, how do you know it's an API? What is it, what it's a, what it's a function? And then how do you know when something is not document API? Um, so information, yep. So that is something I can add to the resources. So how do you know something is a documented or undocumented API and where you can go to kind of get this information? So documented APIs, um, you can kind of get this information inside of Microsoft documentation. You can also, get um, the abbreviations for each um, API on Wikipedia, and there is some um, good Microsoft documentation as well. Um, and then as well as if you utilize the Windows internals book, that is an amazing book. I tried reading that book just for fun on some evenings. It's not a book you read on for fun. It's a book that you read for references, so you definitely utilize that. Um, so documented, undocumented, um, documented, if you see it on Microsoft documentation, then it's a documented API. If you see, if it isn't, um, and you see like typically undocumented APIs, a lot of them that I've seen have been the NT, have started with NT, um, which means native, and then also RTL, which is a runtime control or something like that. Um, but typically there are, there are some resources if you type in those APIs inside of Google, it will come to some resources because the people who have done some reverse engineering have gone ahead and actually went ahead and documented the parameters and what these APIs are doing. So hope that answered your question. Um, what does a handle to a process mean? So um, a process to a handle means that anytime that somebody wants access to a specific process, they have to get a handle. The handle is then gonna pass through the access rights. Um, that is how they're going to then be able to access that process. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, just because um, anytime they want that, they have to get information about that process. And when you get that handle, you then basically saying, hey, um, I want to utilize this process with these access rights to perform X, Y, and Z. And that's what's going to be done there. 
Um, I'll answer a couple more. Sorry, I'm just reading through these. What are some individual tools you suggest using to get this level of visibility for building real-time detections slash monitoring? For instance, seeing calls to mini dump right down. So um, the biggest thing that we can utilize is gonna be code. Um, code is not going to lie. Code is not going to defer me in any wrong way. If we can understand the code, then we can then we can properly walk through that. So tools that I utilize to walk through the code, um, I have utilized IDA very heavily. Some people on our team utilize Ghidra. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, but DNSpy is also amazing. And then I utilize um, when debug or just debugging in general to verify that I'm understanding that process well. Um, so typically, if you have like open source code, you can follow that code um, within GitHub or where they have that code located. Um, if not, you can utilize those tools to then abstract that even better. Um, I'm going to answer two more. Um, Well, he's uh, reviewing the remaining questions we have. Uh, reminder, I, I, I shared out all the links to the previous three days of webinars and then uh, the registration link if you want to attend tomorrow's session. So there was a question, is there a way for attackers to use these APIs and still go off the radar? Yeah, so the reality is um, this information is going to be stored inside of the data. So what is difficult for us as defenders is the um, difficulty of creating um, relationships and data modeling. Um, so I don't know if the question is um, a way for attackers to use these APIs and still off the radar because everything's going to be seen inside of the data, whether or not though that we have the maturity inside of our environment to correlate that data correctly is the real question that needs to be asked. Um, oftentimes, like um, if you go back at the abstraction map and you looked at the Mimikatz version, one Mimikatz implementation is going to utilize like the read uh, memory process or API, and then its access rights that needs is 1010. Well, those are pretty low access rights. Um, so that's going to be necessarily pretty hard to read because a lot of processes are going to have to read um, LSAS. So that is more of a stealthy way to do it. However, the real key inside of environments is having a good maturity and be able to correlate our data effectively. Um, Let me answer one more. So uh, one question was, apart from Windows internals book as a reference, what other prerequisites do you suggest to reach to a level of abusing the Win APIs? Um, in terms of prerequisites, um, it really comes down to coding. Um, you, like the best way, and this has been explained to me many times um, from a lot of my mentors is that, um, and this is something I've utilized as well, the best way to understand how APIs are being used and how they can be abused or through actually coding the APIs to do specific things that you want to do. Um, a good um, reference for that is go to um, PS Reflect, PS Reflect, Reflect functions. Um, you can utilize PowerShell to call different um, API, invoke different API calls. And in doing so, you can start to pass through parameters and start to do different things to better understand the APIs and how they work. Um, that is something I definitely suggest, or just coding them yourself. That's going to be um, something that you can utilize for sure. And yep, so that's all the questions I'm gonna to answer today. Thank you for all for coming, I really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me on Twitter or I'm in a couple of different Slack groups in the Bloodhound Slack um, and I'm more than happy to answer any other questions anybody might have. And these, um, the presentation will be um, online later on as long with the video. So I'll pass it back over to Justin. 
Thank you, everyone. And like uh, Johnny said, the, uh, the links uh, for the video and slides will be shared shortly. Thanks for joining and see you tomorrow.